Thank That's you, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> First, thank you so much for joining today. I know you are all very busy um, trying to finish up with papers that you're marking for university and getting through the coursework with us. So we appreciate you jumping on um, to learn a little more about polling devices and just formative assessment overall. We're gonna, today the plan is to go through what it will look like for you and then for those that you are training um, in the future. So we'll go over formative assessment. We'll look at our website a little bit where you can find our presentations with the formative assessment. And then we will actually look at a few different polling devices that we think will be best for your use. And then all throughout, if you have questions, please either drop, drop them in the chat window. We have Audra with us from NJCTL as well. Between her and Susan and I, we will be sure to check that window. And if not, just unmute and say, please stop, help me out, I'm confused. Don't let me get too far ahead of you that if something doesn't make sense. Let's go ahead and get started here. Share my screen with you. We do have a presentation for today that we can also send to you. Susan and I were talking and we thought this could even be good for you to use in the future um, with some of the teachers that you will be. So formative assessments, like we talked about um, in the past and have you, as you have seen in the course, they are meant to be every single day with NJCTL's materials, every instructional lesson, I should say. Um, they are built right into every presentation that we offer. They are there for you. We make it nice and easy, um, short, simple, quick. They also tie into the social constructivism that we've talked about. Let's go ahead here. So formative assessment, as we said in our curriculum, their consistent and proper use is the key component. So we really wanna make sure that you understand how to use the formative assessment and then can turn key that to the teachers that you're training. So our questions are also within our presentations scaffolded. You'll see the easier questions first and then we build upon that. By the way, a lot of these slides that you're seeing today are also in the methods presentations. So if you ever need to go back, look through those methods presentations as well and you will find them. So each formative assessment question is designed to be worked on by the students in their groups. So that's the social constructive part of it. So you present the question to the students and then they talk in their groups. It's not meant to be like an assessment where you're testing to make sure, hey, you know this and you're gonna get a grade. Let them work on it. Let them learn from each other in their small groups. So the question is presented to them and then give them a chance to talk about the problem, explain it to each other. Hey, I think it's answer C because, and let another student talk with them. During this time, it's really meant to be that the students are talking and working together because we know that they really do learn from each other really well. In order to collect the answers from your students, and that's where I think a lot of the trainers that we're working with are like, what are you guys talking about with the polling devices? So we recommend polling devices as a way to get the data from your students and then you have an opportunity to look at it. So it's all anonymous. It's also meant as best as you can. I know with technology, different things, we're gonna show you some easy ways, but to be able to look back at that data as well. And you can look at, oh, these students really struggled. Let's pair them up with you know, another higher student. So the polling devices are just a simple, quick way to collect your data. And then it's again, anonymous to each other, but as an instructor, you will have the names and who answered. So we'll look at that a little further in this presentation. 
So for why we want to use polling devices, I kind of already said this, but we want them to participate individually. So yes, we just said working together in their small groups, but then once they talk, we really have to teach them that their answers are their own answers. So just because the person next to you said it's A, doesn't necessarily mean they're correct. It goes back to that answer honestly within what you believe, because that's the only way as an instructor, you what they really know and you can drive your instruction. So that kind of starts on day one when you set up polling devices with them, any kind of formative assessment. You want them to understand that formative assessment is not you giving them a grade. It's you collecting the information to help drive your future instruction with them. So they're, like we said, they're answering anonymously to each other, but as an instructor, you will see the data and then consistently, constantly evaluate what they know. So you're not going to let them get four or five lessons into a unit and realize they didn't pick up on lesson one. They didn't get that information. So that's why we say to do it constantly so that as soon as you see a problem, you're able to stop, address it before you move on. We've also found that polling devices really keep the students focused and engaged. We know we are up against like all kinds of phones and different devices that kids are constantly looking at. And as an instructor, just the person standing up there, we're kind of boring at times. So this is a fun way to keep them engaged in the lesson. Polling allows teachers to get the feedback from everyone. We know you have some students in your course that are going to be raising their hands every single question you ask. But then you also have the quiet kid that's afraid to answer, too shy, they're afraid they're gonna mess up. Well, this is a chance for everyone to answer and that you're getting feedback from everyone, not just a certain amount of kids. And then it also shifts your class to student-centered. So it's no longer you just standing up there being the one person. The students are really taking the participation now. And like we said, it gathers some real-time data. So before we go further for this, we're going to look at the website. We want to show you with NJCTL where you can find the formative assessment within our presentations. I know after speaking with a few of the trainers, it's a little confusing that we have our Moodle courses, which you are taking for teachers, but then to turn key and use our materials with your students. So right now I am on the njctl.org website. I am already logged in. I can see from the names, I believe almost everyone on this call has already logged in, started the courses. So you should be able to get here, no problem. Right up towards the top is this teaching materials. We're going to click on that. And as we've talked about in the past, we have courses for math, science, computer science, math and science from grades K up to some early college, like pre um, AP courses for you. So we're going to click on, let's go into, we're going to math. Then let's just click on geometry for now. So let me go back, sorry. Under math, these are all of the different courses that we have from kindergarten all the way up. We're gonna click on geometry. And then these are our different units or chapters. You can see they are all here. We're going to go into angles. When we hit view and I go in, these are all of the resources that are free to all instructors, everyone that is, um, has an account with us, teachers, no students, but the teachers can get all of these materials. The students can see all of this, except for the assessments as well. But we are just going to look at the presentation for right now. When I click on presentation, we have our presentations, they are in smart notebook or as a PDF. Let's just open, I'll open the notebook for right now. I believe some of you have already 
use Smart Notebook. If you need help with Smart Notebook, please feel free to email us. We have um, a way that you can download it for free. Audra, who's on, is great. Even if you have a Mac, different computers, we can help you get Smart Notebook downloaded for free. And then you can use that. The PDF is great as well. Sometimes Smart Notebook, we have interactive pieces. We have teacher's notes on the side to pull out. With the PDF, you can't pull those out. But this presentation here where it says one slide per page will be the Smart Notebook with the teacher tab pulled out for you, but as a PDF. So when I look at a presentation, we've talked about direct instruction um, in the previous module. So when we go through, you'll see in the presentations is dark blue. Dark blue font is our direct instruction. This is the teacher's part that you're teaching. Students are still interacting, but this is your main lesson. They're short, like we've talked about, 10 minutes, nothing crazy but as you then go through you will come to a slide that is black these are the formative assessment questions that we've been talking a lot about with the njctl materials they're black they are all in multiple choice format so that way you can use different polling devices that are more simple you can even do a whiteboard and we'll talk about that we know sometimes you might just need to keep it simple so all of our problems are done as multiple choice. There is the answer D, um, I need help. So if a student is truly confused, instead of having them guess, they can use this, I need help. But again, it's anonymous, so they don't have to worry about saying across the class for those kids that don't wanna be like, I don't know this, that's there as well. So we, there are about five for most units. Um, quick questions again, that one only has three, so sometimes they're shorter, it all depends. Um, we will look even more as we go through this on how to use them, but I wanted to make sure that you know where to find them. Does anyone have any questions? Or Audra or Susan, do you want to add anything about our presentation with formative assessment? Nope, I don't have anything to add. I'm the same. You explained it very well, Chris. Thanks. <laughs> but any, again, please interrupt us, jump in, email us after and say, hey, I need a little more help. Where can I find this? It's still not making sense. We are here to support you through the entire process. So again, that's where to find them. We have them for math and science. So everyone through this program should have um, coursework if they want to go through when they're training the teachers as well. All right, let's go back over to our presentation. Slide, slide that over. So how do we use the formative assessment effectively? These are different strategies. And as Susan and I were going through, we're like strategies, also like procedures, kind of you go about using them. So from the very beginning of using formative assessment and the polling devices, you want to talk with your students about the value of them. It's kind of what I mentioned earlier. Really get them to buy into this. These formative assessment questions are truly to help them because it's going to help you drive your instruction, which ultimately goes back to providing better instruction for your students. You want them to make sure that they are being honest, talk about, don't copy from your peers, make sure that you're answering your own answer. And then you always wanna make sure that formative assessment questions, you're asking them after teaching the new concept. So this is allowing you to say, yes, my students got it. Hey, they got every single answer, right? I'm gonna move on. Wow, most of my students got it wrong. I think I need to go back and reteach here. So it's really giving you feedback instantly. You're not going to wait until a quiz that's given in a couple of days, or even until a student comes in after trying the homework and they're like, I don't get it. This gives you instant, quick feedback right after your lesson. 
And then you want to make sure you're asking your formative assessment questions one at a time. So you're going to show the question. Your students are going to talk in their small groups. And then we'll dig into this a little more. You're going to discuss the answer and go through that with your students right away. So don't give all three questions and say, answer these three questions and then go back. So it's one at a time really broken down. And then you want to use the formative assessment to expand on the learning. So just like I said, these questions are really meant to drive your instruction and drive your on where you're going to get, where you're going to go next. And then this is a tough one. I know even for me as a teacher, this was tough. You want to avoid answering their questions as working on the question. You really want to have your students say, help ask your classmate. In the presentation for methods, we quickly mentioned that ask three, then me. You want to get your students used to talking to each other and not just quickly coming to you as the instructor. So if they ask you a question, kind of turn it back on to them to ask their peers or to try. It's, I know it's a hard one when they ask us a question that we want to jump in, but you really want to hold off during the formative assessment. You're going to add and skip formative assessments questions as needed. Again, we'll look a little more in the future on this, um, but if you find your whole class is getting it right, there's no reason just to keep at that same type of question. If you're finding your students are really struggling, the one nice thing in Smart Notebook is you can quickly add a new question and just tweak it a little bit and add that in there to see, okay, do they get it now? Maybe they didn't get it on the first two. We really retaught a little bit. Let's check it again. So all of our resources, I should have mentioned on the website, are editable, you can go through and they're yours. Edit, change them, add things, delete things, change names, whatever works for you, those are your resources. So here we have one of a formative assessment question that we're going to do with you. We are going to do it through the Zoom platform. Yep, so I'm, I'm gonna start a poll so we're actually gonna use one of the polling devices that would be available to you if you were teaching on Zoom. So here is the poll. You should see that it's opening now. So go ahead and answer this formative assessment question. Can everyone see the formative assessment question in the poll that popped up? I see someone answered, that's good. We've got one answer so far. Go ahead and um, you'll read the formative assessment question from the presentation and then use the polling device that's popped up on the screen to select your answer choice. We've got two, so we're waiting for nine others. And just as Susan is like talking this out with you, you would be doing with your students as well. Yeah. So I have two answers out of 11. If this was my classroom, now I have three. I don't wanna end the poll yet. I don't have enough information. Okay, I've got four, five. Six, we're about halfway there. We'll wait about 15 more seconds. Please put in your answer.
All right, so I have 70% of the students. If this was my classroom and you were all close to me, um, I would probably be walking around the classroom and, and checking to see who hadn't yet answered and encouraging them to answer the question. Um, but since we're you know at such a great distance, it's difficult for me to do that. So I'm gonna end the poll now. And you should be able to see the responses. So I can see that um, nobody chose A, but I had some that chose B, C, and D. So my answer choices, I have, I have several different answer choices. So somebody who, who chose, um, why don't you select, I mean, I guess if I say somebody who chose B, there's only, you can see there's only one person who chose B, but um, would somebody like to tell us what their answer is and, and just kind of explain why you selected that answer? Feel free to unmute and um, jump in on the conversation. As for me? Yes. Hi, Jean. I think that I think I, I I didn't see the question very well and I think I've got the wrong answer. Uh oh. So that's, <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Tell us what you selected and, and how you might change your answer now that you're rereading the question. Okay. Can I have that chance of changing the answer? Absolutely. Go ahead. What would you select now if okay. you were given the choice? <laughs> is not is no, oh no sorry um um okay ask for my different question another time all right b okay yeah so you would select b ask formative assessment questions after teaching the lesson yes because uh, pertaining to the question i think if i'm right you're saying which of the following is not a formative assessment strategy right okay yes so the answer to me, I think it's B. Okay. Because I think the the um the sole uh, purpose of formative assessment is to to see if as you 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 your teaching is in progress, for you to see if they are following. So okay. after teaching after teaching the lesson, it'll be too late for me. It'll be too late, and you find that you 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 would you would you would need to go back. So that would take you more time. So it's better to, to ask as you are teaching so that you can have, um, you can correct where some, some, some learners or students are having misinformation or they're not understanding. So B is not a formative assessment strategy to me. That's, what, that's the reason. Great, thank you. Did somebody select a different answer and they'd like to explain what, what answer they selected and why they chose that? We had several who selected C. Would somebody who selected C like to share their um, reasoning? And if you've changed your mind, it's also okay to, to say, hey, I, I selected C, but I actually think it's something else now. Hello. Hello. Please go ahead. We can uh, I, uh, I selected C simply because I found that student, it's, um, students are in progress. You know, they're working. So okay. at that time, they are still working on the, uh, maybe you have given them a task and you are supervising. As you're supervising at the same time, you are assisting them. Of course, it's the part of formative assessment, but you are not getting you know, the feedback. They are still in progress, I would say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Would anybody else like to discuss their selection? This one's this one's kind of tricky because um, if you look back at the presentation as we've gone through, um, 
we definitely know. So if we're asking which is not a formative assessment strategy, we can quickly kind of get rid of A because we know that asking the formative assessment questions one at a time is a good idea. Um, and we, we know that we definitely can skip formative assessment questions as needed. So that really brought us down to B and C. Um, and we've had good, good uh, reasoning and responses for why each of those was selected. So I think that, yeah, at, given the um, explanations, both of those could be correct. Um, I think that we were heading for C um, because we were, I think that the after a lesson was that key that was sort of, um, you know, that that was the thing that B hinged on. And I think that um, when Kristen was talking, she was saying after each lesson, we should definitely do formative assessment because we don't want to wait several days. But Jean, you make perfect sense in saying, I don't want to wait until after a lesson. I want to embed my formative assessment within my lesson. So um, that was tricky. I'm swayed. I could have chosen either B or C. <laughs> This, uh, you know what, Jean, you made me stop. And I think rewriting this, I would say after direct instruction. So not after the entire lesson, but after you go through those 10 minutes of teaching at that point. So not after an hour, but do your direct instruction with your students and then the formative assessment. So I think that lesson, I don't know, Susan, does that make more sense to you? Yeah, that makes more sense. But those are, see, this is good conversation. And this is exactly the goal of formative assessment questions in the PSI PMI classroom is that it's not just your direct instruction as the teacher where the kids are learning or where the students of any age, really adults too. It's not just the direct instruction where the learning occurs. It's the conversation between peers and the conversation after the formative assessment question polling stops where a lot of our understanding comes from. Great, should we move on to the next slide? All right, so here we're gonna watch a video and this video is gonna show a teacher doing um, formative assessment in her classroom with her students. She's using polling devices, although that's not um, highlighted quite as much in this, you're just gonna kind of see her quickly using them. Um, but we're gonna go through two questions or the teacher's gonna go through two questions in the classroom. And you're gonna, um, as you're watching, just note the differences in the teacher's actions during the first question versus her actions during the second question. So really taking note of how she engages the students and the class during the first question and then how that changes in the second question. And we're gonna discuss that when we finish watching. Oh, Kristen, um, you know what, you, you might have to pause, you might have to unshare and reshare and select your um, computer's audio as, um, so I think you need to, let me go. Yeah. And then there should be a box that says like share computer audio. It wasn't on. Thank you, Susan. No problem. So guys, get out your clickers. Make sure you're logged in if you haven't logged in already. If a brick is slapped to the right on a horizontal surface, what are the directions of the two surface forces? force of friction and the normal force. This can work together in your groups. So we have our free body diagram up there. I notice all of you have answered. Okay. In this question, we have a four kilogram box sliding on a surface. The coefficient of kinetic friction is given up there as 0.25 and they want to know the size of the friction force. So we're going to look for force of friction. Okay. What's the first thing we should do? Draw a free body diagram. Okay, draw a free body diagram. Okay, so here's my brick. 
What forces are acting on my brick? Fn job. Fn job. Hi. Yes. Mg down. Mg down. Hi. Anything else back there? Uh, force applied to the right. Force applied to the right. And back there. Okay. Beautiful. And it doesn't say if it's accelerating or not, so we'll just leave that off for a second. What should we do now? Yeah. Uh, well, we know the formula F equals mu K Fn. Okay. Okay. What do you want to add? Should we list our givens? Sure, we can list our givens. So we know that we're looking for the force of friction. What givens do you know? Uh, well, we know that the mass of the brick is four kilograms. Right. And what did you know? Well, the coefficient of the kinetic friction is 0 0.5. It's fine. OK, remember, that doesn't have any units, OK? So we're just going to have leave no units. Is there anything else we know? Fn equals mg. So OK. So now why, again, is that true? Why are they equal? going down and Fn is going up. Okay, and is it moving up or down? No. no. So if there's no acceleration up or down, those are equal. Yeah. Is there anything else that we know that we should add to our list? G is 9.8. G is 9.8. Very good. What's the units for that? Meters per second. Yeah. Meters per second. Squared. 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 You got it. Good job. Okay. What are we going to do? We're going to plug in mg for fn. OK, in this equation right here? Yeah. OK, so I'm going to rewrite it right there. Mu a mg. And we have a next step. And this, this is um, just take what we got and plug it into uh, the, um, the equation. OK, so I'm going to let you guys give that a shot. Start the question. If you need some help, ask your group. All right, so we saw two questions. Those were formative assessment questions 40 and 41 on the presentation that she was working on. Um, oh, Kristen, we see your geometry presentation. <laughs> um, so let's, let's think back. How did the um, teacher's actions change? Can you go to the next slide? Thanks. All right, how did the teacher's actions in the first question differ from her actions during the second question? So feel free to unmute yourself and let's just kind of have some, uh, some conversation about what we saw. Or also feel free to type it in the chat window if you're not able to unmute. It, it may have been a little difficult to see. This presentation, or I'm sorry, this video is in the formative assessment presentation for teaching methods. So you can link back out and take a look at this video. Um, again, I, I've actually watched it a few times. So sometimes on the first time, it's a little difficult to see. But um, just kind of summing up on that first um, question, she took like one answer. She just asked, you know, what the answer was and kind of quickly confirmed that one person's answer. And on the second question, um, she asked several questions and had the students giving information about the things that they needed to know to be able to answer that question. Um, um, and so she took, a lot of information from students, basically like, what is it that we need to know to be able to answer this question? And she had several students answering. 
Um, and then she had them, you know, discussing um, and answering with their polling devices as well. So there were several questions. Okay, there were two questions. She actually, um, the point in the chat window is really good. There were several questions. Which specific questions are being referred to here? So on her presentations that she was posting, that, that place where she was asking several questions and getting input from lots of different students was actually one formative assessment question. So they'd been asked to solve a, a problem and it was a physics problem. And I think it had to do with friction. I can't remember exactly. Um, but she was soliciting a lot of students input on what things they need to know, what, um, what they were gonna have to put into practice to answer that question. And then we actually didn't see her necessarily do the polling with the students. She was kind of starting the polling right at the very end. So it, it was kind of, and I know I saw some people were like perhaps losing connection during the video as well. Um, so just so that you know, the video is in the formative assessment presentation in the methods um, course. So you can go back and rewatch it. But so in that first question, she had the students answer with their polling devices and she really quickly just said, okay, yes, the answer is whatever and moved on. And in the second question, she had the question on the board and she was soliciting information from several different students in the class and basically saying, what do we need to know to be able to answer this question? So how is that approach in this, to that second question where she was soliciting information from several students, how was that more effective in engaging the students in developing their understanding of the concept? I won't keep putting you on the spot. Oh, go ahead, Martin. I think that was uh, you that unmuted. Yes, uh, uh, just to make a comment, I think uh, she was trying to solicit the views mm -hmm. so that uh, what they already know, that's what uh, the teacher wants to build on as they were trying to solve the problem. Excellent. That's what I saw too. Other thoughts about her approach in the second question? Hi. Hi. Go ahead, Jean. Yeah, I think uh, there are some students. I think out out um, in my sometimes I meet such situations where there are some students who read in advance. So you want to? I just want to concur with the preceding uh, uh, person who was commenting that sometimes you want to know where they are at the level where they are, so that you can be able to. Uh, the, the other learners can learn from their uh, friends and it's very easy for them to understand it's more it's easier to, for them to understand their friends than you directly so for you you just have to add on whatever they have already read in advance or they already know of course there are others who are blank on that concept but others read in advance and others discuss in advance what you're going to, to, to teach. So you have to know where you can start, what you can add on, and how you can uh, uh, yeah, go about that concept, uh, looking at what they already know. So it's just bridging the gap, something like that. Yeah, excellent point. And also it's really like, as you pointed out, it's very helpful when you have students in the class who have an advanced understanding of the concept just explaining what their thinking is and explaining how they're solving a problem or explaining the the concepts that they've learned that they're using because that really does a lot in helping those students who are kind of blank slates just sitting and they're not really sure what to do so it's it's a really effective way to to bring all students along so let's go ahead and um move on we're going to talk a little bit um, more about um, how the teacher can reflect on students' answers um, and then use that to fuel the conversation. So after each formative assessment question, 
you're really going to use the results to inform what you do next. This is the link between formative assessment and instruction. So I don't want to just say, like as the teacher did in that first question we saw, when we pull up a formative assessment question and we have all of the students discuss it and submit their answers, I don't want to just say, okay, yes, C's right and move on. I want to have conversation because it's that conversation that occurs during the formative assessment questions that really, like Jean, as you were saying, those students who are really have a good firm understanding, them discussing what it is that they know about the question and how to solve that problem is what helps move other learners along. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so you're going to, as you go through a formative assessment question and you use the polling devices, you want to share the results with the class, but you don't want to reveal the correct answer right away. So that's that's a key. And that's something that's a little difficult sometimes um, when people start first using the formative assessment questions and the polling devices. So it's easy for a teacher to see when, when showing the results, what your breakdown of, of students who got the right and wrong answers, but it's much more powerful for the students to go through the process of kind of uh, developing an understanding um, through discussion. So let's talk about some uh, situations that you might see. So when you do a polling question and you share the results, if you have all the students who are correct, you know that you don't need to have a lot of conversation about that question because the students already understand that concept. So you can just do a quick verbal follow-up or move on to a more difficult question. If most of the students are correct, you wanna try to identify someone, uh, like have the students find somebody who chose a different answer. So if you have most of the students correct, have the students have some discussion at their table about like which, which, or which answer choice they chose and to try and find somebody who had a different answer choice than them, and then they can have some conversation. And during that conversation, the student who chose the wrong answer is gonna hear from somebody who chose the right answer, and they're gonna go back and forth about how they worked that problem. And, and typically, the students are gonna come, those who had some misconceptions or maybe followed a, a process wrong or somehow came to the wrong conclusion, they're going to get information from the other students and they're going to learn how to solve that problem correctly. And at that point, that's when the teacher confirms the answer. So you don't want to just jump directly to giving the answer. You want to let the kids or the students um, go back and forth about what answer choices they chose. So let's go ahead. This is a really interesting and exciting one. So if the class is split, you have um, answer choices A, B, C, and D, and, and students chose, you know, all over the map. Maybe 20% chose A, 30% chose um, B, and 50% chose C, and nobody chose D. So you can tell that there are students that, you know, have selected many different answers. So this is really the key time where you want to have people um, having some conversation. You want to solicit the students um, to explain their answer choices, to explain how they solve the problem. You might even have the students get up and move around the room. We're going to see this in a little while in another video that we're going to watch. Students get up, move around the room, find somebody who chose a different answer choice than them, and then um, have some conversation about which answers choice they chose and how they how they came to that answer. And then after they've had a chance to um, to have some conversation with their peers, you want to re poll the question. So you had students who were all over the place. They had some conversation and you actually are going to restart the question. So you're just going to ask the question again. And now hopefully with that new understanding, you're going to have like many, many more students choosing the correct answer. So that second time you, you pull the students, you're going to find that their answer choices likely are going to change a little bit. And maybe rather than having 20% A, 30% B, and 50% C, you might have 5% A, 5% B, and 90% C, and C is the correct answer. So at that point, you know, 
you've taken some kids who or some students who had misconceptions or did not have a full understanding of how to solve a problem or answer a question, and you've brought you know, many, many more closer to understanding that concept. So that's a fun one. <clears throat> now, if you ask a question and only a few students get it correct, this could be due to a miscommunication or a gap in their understanding, or, or maybe they misunderstood the question. A lot of times there's tricky questions like, like the one we did before, what is not a um, strategy for polling? Sometimes you might find that the kids just didn't answer or didn't read the question carefully um, or the students. I'm sorry, I have a hard time not calling them, you know, thinking of kids in classrooms, but you're all university professors. So your students are much older. Um, so it might just be a question of, did they read the formative assessment question carefully? Are they missing just one piece of the information? You might wanna go back and reteach some of the slides or ask them to go back and reread with their group the slides. Um, and then again, after doing that reteaching and reviewing, you would wanna re-pull the students and see if they, um, if they can answer that question after. And, or you may want to just ask a more, like an easier question and just sort of scaffold them through the process of answering that question. Let's go ahead to the next question or the next slide. Okay, so we have a formative assessment question here. I'm gonna open up the polling, uh, relaunch. All right, so you should see a formative assessment question on the screen and also a polling device so that you can answer this question. I think answer choice C should say move on to oh. a more difficult question, right? Yes, thank you. Thank you, okay. Audra. Thanks, Audra. <clears throat> so what would you not do? If all the students get the answer choice correct, what would you not do? Um, I'm I'm back to the question. I want to go back to the uh, to the response. How, how can I do it? Um, do you see that there should be um, there should be a polling device that is showing up on your screen? And you should be able to select A, B, C, or D. Yeah, I saw that, but now I'm having uh, uh, the question back on the like the green, uh, the, the blue, uh, the question on my uh, screen. I can't go back to the to the to the choices. Oh, hmm. are you on your cell phone? I think you click on the screen, then down yeah. there you will see the symbol for pause. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, we've got only one response. Maybe this is an indicator to me that we should uh, <laughs> have a little more conversation on this. I'll give you guys a, maybe a few more seconds, or perhaps it's just a polling. Uh, issue if you're not able to see it. This is another opportunity to remind your students or your students that it's anonymous. So pick whatever you think. Nobody else is going to see, you know, your answer if you're on the fence. It's a great time to constantly be reminding them as well. All right, we have about half the, um, we have, a, well, we have about 37%. I'm gonna end the poll. So you should be able to see the responses. 
one selected A, one selected C, and one selected D. So here, I mean, just for the sake of time, because we're supposed to end um, in just about a half hour, the one, it's actually interesting. I think perhaps the not has thrown everybody. Um, if you have all students answer correctly, it would be appropriate to ask a similar response question or move on to something difficult, more difficult or do a verbal follow-up. But if everybody is correct, you don't need the students to explain their answer. So the answer, the correct answer here is actually B. Um, so I, I have a feeling that not kind of threw us all for a loop. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next question or the next slide. All right. So here we have another polling question. What do you do if only a few students get the answer correct? So most of the students are incorrect. What would you do? This one should be easier. It's not a not. <laughs> I should say for B, where it says go back to the slides, um, think of like in our NJCTL materials, the slides are your direct instruction. So that basically is like go back to your presentation, your instruction, whatever you were using and review or revise. Okay, we have 71% of people have responded. We'll just give it a couple more minutes if you haven't had a chance. Well, not a couple more minutes, maybe 30 more seconds. <laughs> All right, I just have one more question or one more uh, person to respond. All right, and I'll stop the poll. I'm gonna share results. All right, so we are split between, can you guys see the results on the screen? Great, okay. We're split between A and B. So if you have only a few students who get the answer correct, we can, let's knock out C and D and we'll just look at A and B. Should we ask a similar response question or go back to the direct instruction slides and review or revise? What do you guys think? What would you do? Feel free to unmute or type in the chat window. For me, I think it would be better to go back to the slides, talk more, clarify issues for the learners to understand before I can give them a similar response question. Because doing A would be like I'm reassessing them, but reassessing before I do B, for me, I feel like it would not be the right thing to do. Okay. Anybody else that chose B that wants to talk about why they would choose to go back and review the instruction? What about A, somebody who chose A? Yes, can I come in? Yes, please do. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, A, uh, because uh, maybe the students may not get the question right in the first place. So maybe giving them a similar question, but change some words so that uh, uh, maybe they are able to grasp the ideas through changing or altering some words. Uh, uh, that would open up their 
uh, minds or that would open up their thinking to say maybe the question is trying to ask about this idea. So just vary some words and uh, let them try it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So we've had an explanation for why somebody might choose A and why somebody might choose B. Would somebody like to say why they would not choose something? Why would you not choose A or B? Why would you think about this, the answer you chose? Why would you not choose the other one? Martin, I can see that you're still unmuted. Why would you not choose, you chose A, I believe. Why would you not choose to go back and review or revise your, um, or reteach? Uh, it's a lot. So first of all, before going back, you need just to try to, 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 to change the way the question has been asked. And from there, maybe that's when you can go back. Uh, but the first attempt, uh, give them a second chance. And then when it's when you can move. Uh, with the other steps, maybe going back to the whole week. Thank you. Okay. So you're saying going back to review and revise or, or going back to reteach the concept would be very time consuming, it sounds like. And so you'd rather try one more question before going back to do that. Yes. Okay, I understand. So if we had a larger group here right now, I would probably continue to have conversation about this question um, and have some more, um, some more uh, people justify their responses and, and have some more conversation about why they chose to go back and revise or, or review or reteach and why they chose to ask a similar question instead. Um, we don't have a lot of people right now, so I'm I'm actually going to just move on because we'll see this kind of in action. Um, but yeah, I could see the justification for either. If if the problem was that this the question was just asked in a way that the students didn't understand, you would save yourself quite a lot of time in reteaching by just asking the question a little differently and seeing if they understand it. And then if still you have only a few students who get the question correct, then going back and um, reteaching the, the information. Or if you say, hey, I only have a few students who know how to answer this question. Asking another question won't help because there's not going to be anyone to explain how to do it. Only a couple of people understand it. I'm just going to go back and reteach right now. Either one would work. So I'm going to um, stop the poll and we'll move on. All right, so we're gonna watch a video and this is gonna show um, some different examples of how a teacher is reacting to formative assessment questions in the classroom. So as you watch, I want you to just identify techniques that the teacher is using and being like reflexive to student responses. So the teacher, those things that we talked about, seeing how the students respond or seeing what the students answers are or how the students respond and then responding appropriately as the teacher. So that's what you're watching for, how the teacher uses the student responses to inform what she does next. So most of us said left and up, a couple of us said right and down, and a couple of us said left and down. If somebody would said left and down, what might they have been? 
force normal is a downward force? Okay, force normal is a downward force. And while the, the magnitude, the number of the normal force and the mg are equal, are they in the same direction? No. Then values are equal, those magnitudes, but not the direction. Uh, and what about somebody who said A, right and down? Is it possible that we could have our friction force to the right? Well, if the box was, if the brick was slightly left, then it would be on the right, but it isn't. Right, so it's not necessarily wrong to say that your friction force is to the left. It's just that most of the time we say the applied force is to the right. Okay, guys, so use Newton's second law, F equals MA, to see if you can solve this problem. If a net force accelerates a mass with an acceleration A, and the same force is applied to a mass that's twice as big, what's the acceleration? Don't forget to hit enter. Oh, 50-50. So half of you said B and half of you said C. So if I get everybody who said B up here in this side of the room and everybody who said C, we're right over here. Okay, so 50-50, find your partner, convince your partner that you are right. You have two minutes and then I'm going to re-poll you. Okay. Why do you think it's a You multiply it on one side. No, no, no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. Oh, that makes sense. I see right. Yeah. It made the mistake there. Don't hold the equation. Sigma F equals MA and 2. And if it's, and you, you isolate A, then it will be 2A. Okay, guys, your two minutes are up. Let's have a seat, please. Okay, I'm going to clear the results and we're going to do this again. Yes, ma'am. So you're going to answer C this time? Okay, guys, put your answers in. Oh, wait. Start the question. Put your answers in. <coughs> okay, perfect. Everybody got C. Can somebody tell me what you realized? Yes. You use the wrong equation. What equation did you use? You didn't switch around the variable. Okay. So when you double the mass, if Something gets bigger, what happens to the acceleration? It gets smaller, so it had to go down. Perfect. All right. So real quickly, I just want to like clarify what we saw, because I don't know if it was difficult for everyone to see that. Basically, what we saw was the teacher asking the same formative assessment question three times. The first time she asked the question, there were answer choices with there were three different answer choices and they, it was the students were kind of all over the place so several answered one several answered another and several answered a third answer choice so then she solicited some information from the students about what they might do to solve that um, problem and then she opened the polling again and re-polled on that question and that time she was had answer choices that were split 50 50. And then she said, hey, I see B and I see C. If you were B, go to that side of the room. And if you were C, go to the other side of the room. Now find a partner and convince somebody why you are right. And then they had conversation and then they all went back to their seat and she pulled a third time, same question. If you notice the students answered almost immediately, it took about five seconds. She stopped the poll and 100% of the students had answer choice C. And then she said, hey, answer choice C, for those of you who changed your answer, tell us what you did wrong. And then she had some students 
give their understanding of you know what they had done wrong the first time and how they solved it correctly the second time. So let's go ahead to the next um, the next slide. Real quick, I want to add in there, Susan, too, because I know with some of the assignments that like social constructivism is a little tricky with the strategies. And this is another great strategy of having the students teach each other. She didn't need to go back and reteach. She let them, the two students got together and they taught each other. It took the teacher out of it and made it more student centered and they got to talk. So another great strategy when you're doing social constructivism. Awesome. So great. All right. What strategies from the presentation did the teacher employ? Well, Kristen just said one of them, having the students get together, someone who chose B and someone who chose C get together, argue about the right answer. What else did you see happen? What strategies did you see um, that we've just talked about that the teacher employed? And also feel free to um, type in the chat window if you're not able to talk or just unmute yourself and go ahead and um, let us know what you think. For me, what I found um, interesting is the idea of throwing back the problem to the students and getting them to talk to each other, each one of them trying to convince the other that theirs is correct. I think in that sort of discussion, one does realize where they missed on the a, a particular question which was there. So I think throwing back questions to students, it helps them to reflect on their own thinking. What was I thinking at that time? I should have done this. And that's what helps them to change their way of understanding. It enables the conceptual change. Exactly. Yeah, you're, you're hitting on that second question too. Good. Any other thoughts? That concept of re-polling or that strategy of re-polling the teacher used, she didn't just move on quickly. You know, it's sometimes it's better to, to go slowly and allow conversations to occur and allow a lot of, um, you know, that back and forth because as Margaret was saying, that's what changes the conceptual understanding. All right, so we're gonna move on. So we're actually now gonna talk about polling devices. So how to use the polling devices themselves. We recognize Susan and I both are aware too that time is flying and we're like, oh no, we don't have a ton of time left. Yep. So I'm like, okay. I'm like quick because we really want to show you actual devices to use. Yep. Please, again though, if something's not making sense, just stop me, shoot an email after, put it in the chat window, but we are gonna kind of go through this part pretty quickly. We wanna right away from day one in your classroom that you start using polling devices, set up a routine for them. So for most of the trainers that I'm hearing from, it sounds like Flickers or Socrative, are going to be the easiest. Um, Socrative, if it's a one-to-one -one device that the students are bringing in, you really don't have to worry about the storing of them. Flicker cards, I actually, so for flickers, when we start looking, it's cards. They're just like card stock. Have an organization system. Where do they keep them? Where do they grab them? Hey, every time you walk in the room, you pick up your flicker card. Every time you walk in the room, you pick up a Chromebook. Whatever they are using, have a routine for them that's consistent. And then be strategic about when you start your polling questions, like when you actually start the question, um, because you don't want students answering before they talk with their group, before they think it out. You always have that child, the student, that might be a little more impulsive, sees a question, just instantly puts an answer in without really thinking it first. So share the question, give a little time for them to think about it before starting. And same type thing about stopping. So you saw Susan was a perfect example in the polling uh, questions that we did. 
she waited a little bit. She said, okay, we only have, you know, 30%. Let's give it a few more minutes. I know there's some more. Okay, we have most people. So give some time. Um, polling devices are, again, like we said earlier, only for ungraded. These are not their tests. They want, you want them to be comfortable with really answering honestly without being worried about a grade attached to it. And then maximize opportunities. Um, you can use your polling devices for the do nails, exit tickets, use them all throughout. Um, review homework questions with them. It's a great way for you to collect the data from everyone. All right, Susan is going to talk about the first polling device, which is Socratic. We know there are, again, a ton of different devices out there. From hearing from most trainers, you know, the internet, that is like, yeah, a little spotty here and there. So we've picked Socratic and clickers um, to really show you because it does not require a lot of technology. Um, Socratic is our more technology, Flickers is a little less technology, and then we'll briefly touch about no technology options as well. Great. All right, I'm gonna use the presentation uh, just because it has screenshots from Socrative's website, so it's gonna be easy for you to see. But basically, as a teacher to use Socrative, you're gonna to need to go and, and create an account with Socrative. And you do that by going to their website and selecting login and then sign up now. Go ahead and flip to the next slide. And so by the way, the teacher accounts with Socrative are free. Like you can create an account for free um, and then utilize that same classroom or room name for all of your courses. Yep, exactly. Um, and I, I have one that I developed uh, I just created a Malawi one. That's the name of my uh, my class. And the nice thing is you can edit the name of your class and I'll show you that in just a minute. So you can um, edit it. The free account only allows you to create one classroom. So sometimes you wanna edit it a little. So you're gonna fill out all of the necessary information. And on the last screen, the third screen, you're gonna uh, select Socrative free. And you can see that down there at the bottom. And then you're gonna create your account. And then once you log in, you're gonna be given a room number. And you can see Kristen's is at the top. It says DeAngelis4944. And you can change your room, as I was saying, by clicking the tab that says rooms. And then um, if you go to the next slide, Kristen, I think it shows you how to edit. So here you're in your rooms tab. You can click on that little pencil and you can edit the name of your um, classroom. And then you just click rename and it'll change it. And you can do that as often as you want. So if you wanna to continue to use your free account, but you wanna have the students logging into the same, you know, classroom or a, a unique classroom each time, you can rename it as many times as you want. All right, so once you've changed your room name, um, you can see that it is showing up right there at the top of the screen. All right, go ahead and um, move on. The next thing you wanna do is have your students join the class. So as Kristen was saying, Socrative is the higher tech option. Each of your students will need a device. They can join from a computer, they can join from a cell phone. I think that Socrative has an app that they can join from. Yes, they do. Um, they have a Socrative student and a Socrative teacher app. Like each app is separate. Perfect. So if you have a smartphone, you would download the Socrative teacher application um, and then you can run it through your phone. Perfect. Um, your students would need to download the Socrative student account. And then they, when they open that application, they'll, it'll bring up the room name and that's where they put in your room name to join. Great. So the students can either do it on the app or they just go to that same website, Socrative.com. And instead of choosing teacher login like you do, they choose student login. And then they're gonna input your room name. So whatever you have made as your room, they'll put the room name in. And when they join, if you have a question already started, they'll automatically be able to enter the answer. And if not, you're going to, it'll say, um, waiting for a question to launch. 
So when you're using Socrative as the teacher, you log into your classroom, then your students log in, and from your main dashboard, the easiest thing to do is to log a quick question. So if you don't want to have, you know, set up a big long quiz or, you know, you don't have to set anything up. And what works really well with our materials is you can just launch a multiple choice question. So you can see in that red circle, those three types of questions that you can just do a quick question. And basically it just opens it up and it starts it immediately. Multiple choice is gonna give your students the option to answer one of the multiple choice answers. And you don't even have to type anything in. You can just launch it right there on the go. And I'm gonna do that in just a minute to show you what that looks like. All right, only short answer questions can require students to input their names. You click start to begin the question. You don't have to require students to um, put in their names. And actually we think that polling should be done anonymously. We don't want students to feel like they, you know, we don't want them to be upset if they get the wrong answer. So, all right, go ahead and move to the next one. And when all the students have answered, you click finish. So, Kristen, can I share real quick? And I'm gonna um, share my second monitor. And here you can see that I have logged into Socrative. And this is my classroom. Let's just take about two minutes and see if we can make this work. If we can't, we'll move on. But I'd like you to go to Socrative.com on your device if you're able and put in my classroom name. You're gonna log in as a student and you're gonna put in my classroom name, which is Malawi One. The thing I really love about Socrative is they don't have like, it's always caps lock. So like the kids cannot screw up by, it's gotta be a capital or it's gotta be lowercase. So if you are able to go to Socrative.com, which you can see here. I also just put it in the chat. Thank you. Select student login and put in my room number Malawi one. And I'm going to show you how I, as a teacher, can launch this quick question multiple choice. So I'm going to launch the question for multiple choice. Okay, I'm going to do, I, I have, well, I have no students in my room, but if I had students in my room, you would, I could use my question here. Oh, I have one student. I have two students in my room. This is exciting. All right. So what types of questions start automatically? Is it multiple choice and true false? Is it multiple choice? Is it short answer? Or is it exit tickets? Oh, this should have been what types of questions do not start other. Oh no, 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 that's fine. Well, no, it should have been do not. <laughs> Sorry guys, this is really bad uh, showing of how to do this. So I won't belabor it. <laughs> Because obviously you cannot answer or change the question when the students are in the middle of answering the question, but it is exit tickets. These are the ones that do not start right away. And, and there's kind of a, a hint down here because you can see my quick questions. I have the option for multiple choice, true, false, short answer. So as a teacher, I can do this. And when I finish, um, I will finish the question for my students. But I also have the option when I'm done this will end the responses. Good. And now I can show the students. I had 50% of my answers were B and 50% were D. This was a very poor uh, showing of how to do this. But when I'm done, if I wanted, I could launch another multiple choice question, a true, false, or a short answer question. All right. That was a quick and, and somewhat flawed uh, showing of how to use Socrative, but um, you know, if you have additional questions after the fact, please let us know, and um, and I can also do a better job of uh, showing that in a. Separate that was good, path. Susan. It was good. <laughs> Just the main thing to really point out too is, and there's some teachers get overwhelmed. Like I'm going to have to type every question in. 
That was a perfect example is you don't have to type, retype the question, have Socratic open and have a presentation open and they can both be running. So they're looking at the question from your presentation, but they're answering on Socratic. Do not retype everything. It just takes way too much time for you as a teacher. And we all know we are all short on time in life in general. So don't worry about that. Agreed. <laughs> Same with clickers. So Kristen's going to show clickers. Same thing. Don't don't retype the question. No, not at all. So clickers is our low technology. Okay. Uh, did I just? I went the wrong way. There it is. So clickers is free. The website for clickers is clickers.com. Um, you will sign up for free. I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. This is also within the methods presentation. So if you need to go back, the, it's all right in the polling devices. So clickers.com, you're going to sign up for free, create your account. You will get a confirmation email that you need to just confirm. And then I, it's very similar to Socratic clickers. Okay, so let's, I don't have the pictures I wanted in there. I thought I had them. So once you go on to the website, let me get out of there. I have the website open for you. So you will sign up for free. I have my account. I'm just going to go and sign in. Once you are in, you would go down here to new class, create a class, and then you can name it whatever you want. So it was Susan here, create my class, and then I'm going to add my students. You can just start typing names in and it's all there. You can do first and last, just first, then you go to next. You'll see here, Audra is one, Susan is two, two, that's all you need. You're going to hit done. So your class is now created. When I go back, not seeing, Audrey yell at me real quick to print them. My cards are not up top. Um, I think it's new set, isn't it? At the very top, the very top is that it right there? I think that's a new set of questions. Oh, sorry. So to print my cards. Oh, yeah, oh, get open. the cards over on your bottom right. Get the cards. Download and the pop up on your bottom right. You just to download them. There they are. You know what? Zoom window was covering it. So <laughs> you can buy them on Amazon. All that it is, they're printed on the card stack for you already but you could just download them. So when you download them, it's these funny looking symbols on a page and you can see over here on the side, there's two per page. It's like what I held up before, okay? And when you look at these cards, you can see it better in here. There's a one all on every corner. Then there's an A, B, C, and D. The one is the student number. So Audra was number one on my list. So she's getting card number one. Mm -hmm. In a folder, you can print out multiple packs of these. This one is just printed on like a thicker cardstock piece of paper and then cut in half. You do not, if you want to keep them in your classroom in a bucket, multiple classes can use the same one. They just have to make sure each student has the right number. So mm -hmm. once you have the cards, it's very simple. So I went in and I created go into Malawi and I'm going to create a new set of questions again just like with Socratic we don't want you to retype each question so what I typically would do if I'm using that same per presentation before and it was the geometry all right just abbreviate you can do whatever you want it's not there it's just keeping the title. 
And then I can even just go in here and say this is one, this is number two, so that it will keep the data that you're collecting. But if I go back to my presentation, I could see, okay, in this entire presentation, when I scroll down, go, I think there's 103. That was our, this is the last question. You can have this preset and then your students know we're answering number 103 today, whatever it is. So just put the numbers. You don't have to retype the entire question. What I typically do, because I don't save information, I don't necessarily want to save information. I'm just using the clickers as a way to like gather information is I only yeah. have one. I call it multiple choice question. For that question, I say, choose the, the correct answer. And then for A, I say answer or choice A, B, I say choice B, C, I say choice C, and D, I say choice D. And then I just restart that same question over and over and over and over because I don't, I don't even have time to, to put one, two, three to 103. <laughs> right, yep, whatever works. Again, like make it your own. See yep. what works for you in your class. Um, so then I'm just adding on to Malawi and then they are there. So when you are using these questions on your phone, so only the instructor needs the phone and there is a clickers app. So let me show you. I'm going to see if you guys tell me uh, in that corner, it's a check mark. That is the clickers app that you would need. So once I open it, loading yet, up oh, there it is. Oh, that might be hard to see. You can kind of see, it. I already see Malawi in there. So that's what you are using with your class. I click on Malawi and then I see the questions I just created and I go in and it's there. And you can see, I have it still open on my computer. So the questions are there. So then the student, you're showing the presentation, they see the question, they pick their answer choice by holding up their clicker card. Again, remember that little A, B, C, and D? They're turning their card. The correct answer is up at the top. They're just holding their card with the correct answer at the top. Again, no technology on their half, behalf. In your teacher app, let's see if that'll focus in again. This blue circle, when I hit it, it now, you can see it's like a camera. I'm going to hold it up and very quickly go around my room. It actually reads these cards and gives you all the information. So you can then see, okay, 50% said this, 50% said that, 20%. The data is now on your phone, it's anonymous. Students don't know, you do see who got what because of the numbers on the cards. Let's I real want to say real quick, we're going a little over time. And if you want to stay and you're able to stay, please do. If you have to go, um, if you need to log off, we understand. We're going to finish, even if it takes us a little bit longer so that we have the full recording to share. So if you're not able to stay on, we'll share the recording with you um, later today. So we'll just continue. If, you, if you're if you able to stay, please do. Um, but if you have time constraints and need to get off, thank you for joining and we'll share the information with you, um, the video a little later today. I would say Susan, right? Probably about 10 more minutes. Yeah. Um, we're wrapping up, we're getting there. Yeah. Here is a quick little video of clickers. It's only a couple of seconds long. And these are younger students. You can see they had a question on the board. They're just holding them up like we talked about. Okay, here I go. And as the teacher scans, it does Wow. Ooh. Not bad. So that's it. It's quick and simple. Um, it does have the graph at the end that you share. Hey, I'm Brian Buffington from Pioneer Research. And I'm
give you a great form of assessment tool called Plitter. But very simple to use. Again, once you print these cards for your students, you do not need to continue to print them. I know some teachers were worried they had to print them each class. Once you have a copy, that's it. You don't need it again. You just need the app on your teacher's phone. So the students need no technology at all. Let's go on to tech free options because I know even for some the clickers might be um, impossible to use in your classroom. Just like the clicker cards have the A, B, C, D, you can do the same thing with a whiteboard in your classroom. If you do not have a whiteboard, you could take a piece of paper and laminate it. Some people have taken a piece of paper and put it in a Ziploc baggie, like a plastic bag. And then you can write on the bag like a dry erase with a dry erase marker. And it becomes your whiteboard. In my classroom, I used to use, we call them sheet protectors, but it's like the plastic sleeve that a piece of paper would go into and write on that as a whiteboard. Um, so there's lots of options in creating your own whiteboard if you need to. You can do the A, B, C, and D so that they don't have to write each time. And again, just spin their board with the answer and hold it up so you can see it. Some teachers like to ha still have them after each question write just A or B. Whatever it is that works for you, the main point is that you get the data from your students. You're watching and saying, wow, all my students got this. Oh man, something was lost. Nobody got it right. I need to go back. Um, down the bottom, you'll see, you can always do like the one, two, three, four, one is A, two is B. Susan, did you want to talk a little here too? Um, yeah, that only thing that I like to say with these options, these no tech options, is that students can see each other's answers in this situation. So typically what I would do is say, all right, get your answer. Think about what your answer is going to be. And then I would ask them not to answer right away, but like maybe like hold up your hand if you're ready with your answer. And then I can kind of see who's ready. And then at the end, um, have them share answers. And I'll, I'll start my video a minute. I, I turned my video off because like you, I sometimes have uh, internet bandwidth issues and I didn't want our video to be choppy. But sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, all right, um, with the the hold up fingers or fist to five, sometimes people will call it um, A, B, C, D. Think of your answer when you're ready, maybe sit like this. And then on the count of three, we're all gonna show our answers ready. One, two, three. So that way the students aren't looking around and saying, oh, everyone's got B or has two fingers held up. So I'm gonna hold up two fingers. So that's the only thing with the no tech options, you might have to adjust your, um, adjust your your procedure a little bit so that everyone answers at the same time. So those are just three, kind of three, four, you look at the whiteboards and the fist of five options that we have chosen today to share with you. There are lots of other options out there. If there's another device that you have found that you want to use, one of the other devices we've talked about in methods presentations that you would like more help on, please let us know. We are going to stay on even now for questions. If there's one you want to stay on with us and we can talk to you a little more about, again, we are just here to support you. We want you to be successful. We want the teachers that you're going to train to be successful as well. So any questions, don't hesitate to ask us. Um, that's what we're here for. We hope everyone gained a lot from today and that this makes a little more sense. I know it can be confusing and a little tricky. So hopefully it helped you. If anyone have any questions now, just unmute and shout them out. I'm going to stop the recording now.